Arsenal used Sunday's fixture against Aston Villa as a way to put emphasis on the Champions League. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, Blockman, Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Yeah, look, if you want to make the Champions League feel a more important uh, competition and the fixture on Wednesday feel even bigger than it already did, uh, losing badly at home to Aston Villa to potentially sink our title hopes, uh, that will do it. Yeah, that will make Wednesday feel big, and Wednesday does indeed feel big. It always felt big, but now it feels the big, biglier. I think big Lear is the word. Hey, do you notice that I sound like myself again? I am back. Um, and I feel that somehow I should not have come back because this is not a day I want to be talking Arsenal, but I feel that a problem shared is a problem halved. And I always look forward to speaking to Clive and I always look forward to being with all of you listening to to try to figure out what the heck went wrong, make sense of it and forge uh, ahead. I think there's a lot to talk about the emotion, the reaction, the tactics, the performances, and then try to contextualize it. So it's a lot of work that we have to do today, a lot of heavy lifting. We'll try to get a rewatch in tomorrow over on Patreon for uh, the Bayern first leg to prepare for the Bayern second leg. I know that's something that Clive desperately wants to do, and I think it could be a really good idea to prepare for that game. Um, there's an instant reaction. I, I think, you know, usually when we record the main pod, I'm like, you know, you can take or leave the instant reaction. But I think Clive's thoughts from the ground are really interesting as you track them across the game. Uh, so something that you might want to check out over there. But if not, we're just happy to have you over here. And while I realize no one is in the mood for it, it is our final week of the fundraiser. We are right around 100,000 pounds raised. We want to get to that 150,000 pound mark and to help do that. We've now had another donor offer 25,000 pounds matching, meaning for the next 25,000 pounds, every pound you give is three pounds. If you give 10 pounds, you've given 30. If you give 737 pounds, you've given 21, 2200 and, and 2212 pounds. Someone check my math on that. Let me know if I'm right. But look, the, the kids in the Zattery camp, you know, they're going through this with us every day. They're, they're a part of this journey with us. They're a part of our community. And we should stand for them. And there's so much craziness in the world. I can't even begin to bring that up or summarize it. But I can tell you that these kids are worth the effort. Um, if you want to listen to Leah Williamson talk about it, talk about it on the pod we did together, I think she's well worth a listen. Um, obviously, I went there and it was incredibly moving. So you can go to um, justgiving.com forward slash page forward slash AVP and you can give there. Uh, we have given and will give again um, before this is all said and done. But one more week to give and be entered for a VIP box seat to the Bournemouth game, um, a game that I think still could have a lot of jeopardy online. Um, and we'll talk about whether that's the case or not now. With Clive, you can find him on Twitter, Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. It is wonderful to see you today, even if we have a tough job. And I, I think it is an especially tough job because the volume of, of sort of anger and rage and frustration with this result is extremely high. And I think I understand it, right? I mean, the the higher you build the tower into the sky, the further you have to fall when it collapses. And I don't think this is redolent of last season. I think this is different, and I certainly don't think it is over yet. But again, that feeling of being close enough to touch the stars and then falling is hard. And with Liverpool having lost at home to Palace very unexpectedly, uh, and fortunately, before we kicked off, and City having beaten Luton handily, which I think we expected, this felt like a real opportunity to inch that much closer. And, and we fell far short of it. Um, I, I just want to start quickly with your sense of the emotion. And then I want to do lineups and tactics and all of the things that we usually do. But the emotion has been extreme in the wake of this loss. And I, I want to get a just a heat check on you in terms of what you're feeling, how this hit you um, in the moment, and how you're feeling today, just thinking about where we sit right now in the wake of that result. Yeah, so... Generally, when I see these painful defeats, like, and I look online, I think, okay, this is going to go off. <laughs> this is going to explode. <laughs> and so for me to keep my head, I need to disconnect a little bit from that because it just upsets you. It feels like, you know, when we do a podcast after a defeat, it feels like you got you get beat twice because you got to do it twice. And, yeah. um, and but I don't need to do it 30 times. And that's what it feels like reading some of the things online, you know, and so... You just got to disconnect for your own, keep your own perspective. Obviously, I want to keep yeah. my perspective so I can share it properly. There's some upset, setting things out there, some knee jerk stuff out there, some nice bit of acting by YouTubers out there. It did lots of stuff, but we know the drill. This is the modern world that we live in. You know, Elliot, it's I, I probably annoy some of the patrons because I I recover quite quickly. 
You know, like I, <laughs> I get to a place of reason quite quickly and they're not ready always to hear that. You know, sometimes it's really quick, you know, because I recognize that if you dwell on bad results too much, all you're really doing potentially is each individual person how they grieve around a defeat. Some people go towards players they don't like, you know, mm. positions they don't agree with. Um, they go to wages, contracts, the manager. They go to the fans and their behavior in the ground. They go, you go where you like, what affects you on that day, and that is your right. Um, it's a difficult one because we've done so well this year, but I do think sometimes when you get a defeat, you get a chance to look at the lessons learned and maybe have a fresh look at who we are, what we want to be, and what identity we should want to be for this remaining phase of the season. And that's where my head's gone this morning. Can, you mentioned it, so I want to ask you. I, mm -hmm. I have made it my uh, solemn promise to not criticize fans who are at the Emirates when I am not at the Emirates and to just try not to criticize fans in general because yeah. I don't like gatekeeping around fandom and I don't like the idea that there's one right way to do fandom. I will say that we have been on a run for four months that has clearly distinguished us as the best team in the world, in my view. Um, we are a week removed from going to Brighton and absolutely pasting them with a performance that was sensational. Um, from fighting back to be level with Bayern in the Champions League, which I think was a, a, a creditable performance. I think this has just been an incredible run that we're on. And it it strikes me how quickly the goodwill can erode. That you yeah. are one late loss at home away from it feeling fairly toxic. And and I, again, I'm saying that at a remove, having watched it on a phone, on a VPN, on a dodgy stream. So I want to yeah. be ca careful, right? Because I was traveling back from my holiday, which uh, ended at the worst possible time, I guess. But um, do you have any thoughts, not critical thoughts, because again, I don't, I don't want to be critical of how other people do fandom, but thoughts on the reaction in the ground, um, maybe to individuals or to the result or, you know, at the end with people leaving, like I said, I, I'm just curious at how quickly some of the goodwill was able to erode in, you know, in a half of football. Yeah, in the ground, you don't get the same heat as you, you get online. Mm. However, I, I'm a big believer in that fans generally know what they're watching. And there's a lot of similarities between Bayern and, and Villa, actually. Um, Bayern, we were able to react. Villa, we were unable to react due to the timing of the goals and how they came quickly together. I've rewatched the game this morning, Elliot, so I've got a good feeling of the game. In the ground, though, I will say... I can only talk about myself. I, sometimes I, I get up a minute or so to go, to go and start a recording <laughs> for <laughs> for you, and particularly when we're winning. But when we're losing, I tend to stay. Mm. And just it's just my own way, because I feel like, just me being a little old softy, I feel as though the players need to see you more when other people have left. When we've won, no one's and everyone wants to stay behind and cheer, no one's going to miss me. But when... That's just the way I work. Right? I think, well, they need... I see Odegaard walking around. I see what he put out on that pitch. I feel as though I need to stay there until he comes past me. And he's always the last one to come past me. That's just the way I do fandom. So there are a lot of people left because the two girls came together. I understand it. It's not always easy to get out of there. People got trains to get, etc. But it felt like we... I sort of tweeted out earlier, there's no need to throw away everything we've done in 2024 on the back of that. Villa is our hardest home game for me ahead. We didn't beat them. We could have beaten them. They beat us fair and square. You know, this wasn't Brighton last year or Southampton 3-3 or even West Ham 2-0 because they just lucked that one. You know, they got they got away with it. This was, this was, they beat us because we didn't quite execute against them and they executed against us and they beat us. And, what we should be doing or what me and you are going to do, we're going to see, okay, how did they beat us? What did they do? And that's where we should go. Not what did they do? What are they telling us about us? Because there's a lot of similarities to what Bayern did to what they did. And that's two games in a row. And that worries me because I don't want us to you know, show people a, a weakness that we have at this stage of season when every minute and every moment counts because this is not the time to to be rumbled. That makes sense? 
It does make sense. Um, I, I think it also, the reaction shows what City have done to teams trying to win a title in a world where City exists. <clears throat> they have made it feel that any slip of the level is totally unacceptable. I mean, Liverpool lost at home to Crystal Palace. Um, yeah. If City didn't exist and we lost this game, we'd be frustrated. But we would be level on points and ahead on goal difference with a club that just lost at home to Crystal Palace. And you'd say there's still every opportunity. City give you that feeling that no points can ever be dropped. And that, I think, transmits to the fans. And so I think, let's face it, dropping points in a title race is painful. Anytime you do it, it feels existentially painful when you're trying to win a title over Manchester City. So, yep. Can I just hold you there for a second? Get, mm -hmm. Can I hold you there for a second, Elliot? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to say something. That I, don't, I shouldn't do this because I don't know if you've seen it, but Tim wrote a tweet about the game and about how... I did see it, yeah. Yeah, sure City, have, City have turned, you know, the league into almost like the Bundesliga and he's not about to get angry about, you know, about wh what we've done recently. It's, be it's beautifully done. It's a beautiful tweet. Beautiful. And, um, and I thought he captured what's in my head really, really well. We, there is things, something happening in our league about this one team that seems to be dominating. We are trying really hard. But every now and again, we are going to lose a football match. You yeah. know, we don't have to attack each other, attack certain individuals. Hey, look, I can see when someone's having a bad day. Trust me, I can see it. I could go two-footed every week if I wanted to and tell you everything about mm. a certain player, what they did wrong, I'm like, what does that make me? Make me feel mm. good? There you go, I'm unloaded. And so it's irresponsible if you do that without any constructive points alongside it. That's how I feel about it. And, and so, yeah, we've got responsibility here. And if you... If, as fans, and I'm not going to, as fans, as Arsenal people, if we show disunity, we only strengthen our rivals. If you're a Man City fan watching all those red seats yesterday, you're thinking, yeah, they're done. Mm. Do you know what I mean? They're completely done. And I just, I don't want to do that. I don't want to strengthen our rivals. Yeah, we may not beat them. We may beat them. I don't want to give them free ones. we got to stay strong at this moment. I thought Arteta spoke brilliantly after the game. I thought he spoke brilliantly. By the way, he makes mistakes like we all do. But I thought he really captured the moment really, really well about what we need to do now. And hopefully we can focus this week, hopefully. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's exactly it. And I think we do sometimes forget that these other teams, like even Manchester City, right? They have a player who had a bad game that their fans are on their back. Like It, it happens at every yep. club. We're not unique in that respect. Yep. Um you did mention Bundesliga, which does give me the opportunity to congratulate Granit Xhaka on winning a title. And so it's basically like we won the title. So I think that's fine. We can just take the Bundesliga title and the Champions League, and that'll be an unorthodox double that we'll have done this season. Um, so kudos kudos to Granit Xhaka, of course. Um, so this is going to be a tough game to analyze because I think what there are going to be people that want the sharp talons to come out, mm -hmm. and they do need to come out for some things that happen. Those things that happened largely in the second half and largely the second half of the second half. The first half of this game, it was so interesting, Clive, because I didn't get your recordings from the Emirates until after the game had ended because yeah. I had internet issues. And I listened to your halftime audio yeah. after the game was over. And your halftime audio was so interesting, right? Because it was like really good, really encouraged. We look sharp. We look like us. We look, you know, in control. Just a shame we haven't scored. Trussard should score, but it's there for us. Like, it is very hard to discuss a game where you you ship two goals in the last 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, but where you've been so good in the first half. We have to endeavor to do that. And I think a good way to get into that is the lineup because I think there are a lot of people that feel the lineup was wrong. And yet, it was a lineup that allowed us to play a very, very, very good first half. So let's start with that. Um, maybe you can talk me through a little bit of your reaction when you saw it before we kicked off and how it materialized with, with Havertz dropping back into an eight, but we can talk about how he played that eight, and, and Jesus coming back into center forward. Yes, yeah, so I saw a lineup, and given the fact we've been away earlier, but I, I did a little bit of um, reaction to the Bayern game, and Trossard, mm -hmm. Jesus, and Zinchenko ended that Bayern game in really good form. You know, So for me, he picked a form team. He picked the most inform eleven for the start of this game. And it seemed pretty clear to me that we looked high energy at the start. I don't often, I don't always do this, but I Liverpool game was on in the bars. Obviously, we were watching that, had a good few drinks. It all went our way. 
And I decided to go and look at the warm up a little bit more than I normally do. I just wanted to have a look and see what they look like. Because I was I had a little worry about the game generally, because Villa are a good side. And um I and sometimes you get confidence in the warm. When you see the player's skills, I mean that sounds crazy, but when you see them doing their stuff in a relaxed way, you can really see their mm. talent. And Havertz and Odegaard are pinging that ball in the top corner. I'm thinking, yeah, mate, they look good. Did their final runs and they went into the tunnel. I thought, man, they look so sharp. And I actually said, I actually tweeted, the warm-up was sharp. We started the game 100 miles an hour. And I I was fine with it, Elliot. I was absolutely fine. But some it's something I've been talking about recently. We have a few players in our group that are specific to certain game states and roles. Mm-hmm. And... They're quite diverse in their playing, particularly at left back, shall we say, and around centre forward and around left eight. They're probably the three or four positions that we, maybe even left wing, that we really have a diversity of approach. You know, Trossard to Martinelli, put Jesus in there. All three of them are slightly different, you know, and they, they, they bring different things, but also bring maybe some failings, defensive failings for more, maybe a couple of them. We obviously got a left back debate. I don't want to take that one now, but there's a left back debate there and how how that works. And I'll be honest with you, when Sinchenko plays, we don't really have a left back. You know, we have a three two and it's really a strong three two. And you gotta to say to yourself, was that wise given the fact that Musa Diaby was always gonna be super sharp in that space and he was always gonna come off for Leon Bailey, who is not half a step slower. Do you see what I mean? No, I think and, he's better than Diaby, frankly. And yeah. he has been excellent this season. <laughs> my, my son called it. He says they're going to bring him on. They're going to win the game. And he called it before the game. I thought, flipping hell, that's smart. Can I ask you a question about mm-hmm. that? I sort of wonder, and look, we'll, we'll have a big Zinchenko conversation a little bit later in the pod. So mm-hmm. let's just stow that for a second. But I think in terms of the decision to start with him, first of all, he started a week ago in, against Brighton, which was a sensational performance by the, the group, whether you thought he was great in it or not. And he came on at halftime against Bayern for, you know, I, I think a good period of the game for us. So, you know, it wasn't like you're just bringing on a complete bozo who hasn't played recently or played well recently. But I, I tend to think that Mikel thinks in terms of the collective and, and the qualities you need in the group. And if you're going to play with Rice at six and Kai at eight, I think you need another ball progressor who can step into midfield and play vertical passes from midfield. Yeah. And I think we also, as you saw, wanted to unleash late runs from Kai to beat their high line. And Zinchenko did that a few times. In fact, he had one really nice sort of chip ball over the top that Kai just didn't really control the way you'd like. So do you think that the lineup is, it's kind of like a Jenga tower and that the pieces have to fit together a certain way whether it falls apart? I don't think you can play uh, Rice at six, for example, Kai at eight and keep you at left back because then I don't think you have the ball progression, especially the, the line breakers against a high line to do the damage. So is is it, is that the calculus in your mind? Yeah, there's always relationships. I, I agree with you hundred percent. When you take Georgina out, Zinchenko has got to play. It's simple yeah. as that really, isn't it? That's where we are with this team. At the assuming moment. it's not party, obviously. Yeah. I assume it's not party. And um, so georgina has got to play. If, if party was fitter or better, we don't know why he didn't come on in this game, but I'm not going to speculate too much because I just don't know. Um, you need the ball progress at the base of, mid, of midfield, and, and Declan is a he's a metronome-ish, but he's not a a key ball progressor per se. He's a switcher of play side to side, but he's not, you know, that's not his strength, right? His strength is second balls, retaining it, covering, sweeping around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We all know pressing pressing machine. So it, it all made sense. I'm not going to sit here and say it was the wrong team. I can explain it, why you're right about Havertz's runs. It was obvious to me, it was obvious to anybody, he was making runs in behind JT, he's dropping in, trying to pull him around. And um, Bakayo and Martin Odegaard are doing their normal stuff on the right-hand side. Um, they tried to pin Ben White cleverly. I can talk a bit about what Villa did. They they pinned Ben White really well. And and it, it, for me, it, I could see why they did it. I can see why they did it. Um, Trossard ended the game against Bayern really well. Deserves a start, maybe. Give him a start. Right? So, Jesus ended the game against Bayern really well. Sharp, tight. Stock rising. Give him a start. This is not outlandish. I'm not going to come in like Mr. After Timer and say, oh, we should have done, should done that. I have a view about how we should play. But my view should not smash the absolute objectivity around what we tried to do. Do you see what I mean? 
I have a different view about our defensive line and our centre midfield, but mm. I can see exactly what we tried to do. And for Elliot, for literally 55 minutes, it was working really, really well. Well, this is what I was going to say. The way, In my view, the way you should judge a manager's lineup is really essentially the first hour of the game before anybody's really had the chance to Im- influence it with subs and changes and tactical tweaks, or maybe the first half. Yeah. Mikel picked a lineup that played, a, in my view, a dominant first half, a really good first half. And then after halftime, things changed, and we'll come on to that. There are a couple of moments, obviously, to cover in the first half. The the big one, of course, is Troussard finding Emmy Martinez's leg instead of the back of the net. And yeah. it's funny how things can change perceptions, because if Kai has a little bit better close control when he's away from that chip ball by Zinchenko, then... Kai is a hero. Zinchenko is looking like a pretty good pick, right? Because he's picked the lock. And then if Troussard finds the back of the net, Jesus has just played a pretty, I think a pretty nicely played assist. He does a really nice uh, bit of close control to get it under control from a deflected shot and then finds Troussard with the cross. And and a lot of people who are now coming in for criticism, and I think justifiably so, by the way, are are having a little bit of a different kind of narrative around them. I, I think those are two big moments um, do you want to tackle those two in particular? Because I think, obviously, the Trissard one, we have to we have to find a way to take the lead there. Just have to. Yeah. Um, so Kai had a couple in behind Cutler offside. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't worry about that too much because they're more intent. And I think one of the offside ones, by the way, if he scores, is going to come back and and be onside. I I yeah. think those offside okay. flags were not always correct. But okay, I can, I'm not. I can see so. Mm. So I I don't worry about that because that's I'm I'm seeing good intent so I'm I'm not worried about that and I think of the the Jesus cross I think it's Odegaard shot Jesus sort of he healed the cross across he opened up his foot and he healed it across but it was really really good and Trossard this is where pressure and execution comes in so Trossard the guy that always kicks the ball right in the center of it <laughs> on his laces every single time left foot right foot. Elliot, he's towed it slightly. He hasn't hit it centre foot. He's towed it and he's brought it back to the keeper and the keeper's made an unbelievable save. But I I couldn't pick anybody better to slot that in from there. He's our best He's our best finisher in that situation. And he just got it slightly wrong and gave the keeper a sniff and he took it, right? So, And that emboldened them. So, yeah, we, we, we really did manipulate our chances very, very well. We're taking that right-hand slot. Lots of good moves, in-behind runs, composure slowed down, created high-quality moments, if not big chances. There was one in the first half that did annoy me, if I want to see Elliot, when great move down the right, we, we play through the thirds, get out to Saka, Saka does his normal chop, back post, Jesus header. You've got a choice, right? You've got three choices. You head it on target, you head it back across, and the one you don't do is head it out near post and they get a goal. Yeah, that's terrible. Mm-hmm. And I don't, again, intent, Elliot. You see what I mean? I always go about intent, what you're trying to do. You do not do that. There's no excuse for it. You know, there's literally no excuse for it. Two people in a six-yard box and you head it past near post. Goalkeeper just looks at it and laughs and, and, and asks for the ball from a ball boy. Rubbish. That's not smart. That's not good enough. And so the trust half one, unlucky, you know, you could say it's rubbish. It's your choice. You choose your words. Should have scored. Big chance has to go in. If that goes in, we have a team which is set to close out a game mid block. Mm-hmm. Mid blocks. What you got then? We're going to take your counter attack away. What you got? We're going to counter attack you. And we weren't able to see our plan because there was, there was turning points later in the half, in the second half, which then took our belief away a little bit and gave them their belief and it, they grew into the game and ended up winning it. So, it's for, you know, he picked a team for me earlier. I said it yesterday. I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself. He picked a team to score the first goal. He picked a team to control, control the scoreboard. We didn't score the first goal. Our offensive players were mostly all on the pitch apart from Martinelli. When they tired, our, our hope of scoring faded as the game went on. Yeah. No one is going to want to hear this, and I don't want anyone to take this as me saying it's okay. But I do want to point out that prior to the 84th minute of this game that we are reacting to like 
you know, it's the worst performance in history. Prior to the 84th minute, this was 18 shots to nine and one point, what was it? 1.6 XG to 0.37. 1.6 for Arsenal to 0.37. Sounds a lot like a regular Arsenal game, doesn't it? Outshot them, controlled the chances. I felt maybe more in jeopardy because obviously um, Tielemans hits the the bar and the post, and Watkins hits the post. But those are not big chances. Those are really excellent shots that don't go in. I, I don't want it to be regarded as, as excuse-making. I do want to point out that the, the balance of chance in the first half, we were just completely dominant in my view. And in the second half, we definitely faded, and we're going to come on to what went wrong in that portion of the game. But, you know, it, it's... Declan Rice said, if you can't win it, don't lose it. I don't know if I agree with that. I think in a title race at home to Villa, you have to go try to win it. The problem isn't that we lost. It's that I don't think we tried to win it. And the really sad part of this really is that after they got their goals, we didn't have a shot. Like we didn't. We, we, didn't, we weren't able we, to win it. We, we weren't No, able you know what it reminded it. me of, Clive? A little bit. Remember the Brighton game last season at home where we had a goal disallowed, I think wrongly. That would have given us the lead. So similar to the Trissard type thing. Yeah. And then they got a, uh, someone slipped. Was it Kivior? Who slipped, slipped in the box? In the box yeah. He yeah. Sort of, and he Brighton got, pushed got a, over, a free header. Strong enough. Yeah. And they scored. Yeah. yeah. Free header. And then we collapsed. We knew the title was gone. We collapsed and we we lost badly that game. And I, the end of this game felt a little like that. But it sounds like you wanted to come back on saying when I mentioned that, you know, prior to them taking the lead, it, you know, we, there, there were a lot of qualities this game that were somewhat typical of Arsenal, you know? <laughs> yeah. And this is when sometimes there's the. The XG part, the point, the point six, the point mm -hmm. seven, and there is how the chance appeared. And so yeah. the first one, there was a header in central defense. Key, um, Sinchenko comes in to win the header. He top hats it back to our back to Gabriel. Didn't mean to. He just got under it. So that's not smart. Why is our center? Why is our left back taking left back taking headers from center backs? He goes back. And then we, Gabriel goes to flick it out to the wing. He hits Inchenko on the back. Ollie Watkins down one on one with Gabriel. Ollie Watkins loves kicking through legs and cross shot. And he hits the post and it spins out. That shook the ground. Do you see what I mean? It shook mm. the ground. Fairly or unfairly, that's how it felt. Mm. Shoot. You know? And it's like we've done that to ourselves. You know? And I will, I'm going to say this now, the turning point of the game, and I've rewatched it today, the, the moment when they grew and we thought, oh my goodness, corner in the second half, Tinchenko goes out to retrieve it. He doesn't retrieve it, turns it over to Tielemans. Tielemans hits post and bar, or bar and post. And that was a massive escape. And again, it's how it happened. Mistakes that destabilize us. You know my thoughts around defensive stability is the pillar that runs through this team in 2024. And we are looking at this pitch and we can see instability. And we're looking for somebody that's made us unstable. Last week mm. it was Kivio. This week it's Inchenko, as far as we're concerned. Right? So <clears throat> I'm using the raw we here because you know my thoughts. I disagree on some of that yeah. stuff. Um, but it has an effect on the watching audience. We get nervous and it transmits. And that's, it may only be the point whatever, but it felt a lot bigger than that when I was sitting there. Yeah, I think um, I, I want to get into the the things that happened in the second half that are worrying. And I, I do think we can talk about this sort of bozo gene thing because one thing that's been the case for this historic run we've been on. And let's let's try to keep in perspective that we have been on a remarkable historic run. Um is that we've we've done things with a level of professionalism and security and and experience that you need to to do to accumulate points at the rate that we have been. And then in the Bayern first leg and then again in this game, you know, some Bozo gene stuff. Gabriel kicking it off Zinchenko's back, Zinchenko trying to nutmeg Tielemans on the edge of his own box instead of just playing a simple pass and getting out of danger. Like, you know, things like that. And we'll come on to, as I mentioned, Zinchenko in a minute, but can we do just one positive from this game before we do that, which is 
the first half was good, and it was good in large part thanks to Martin Odegaard. And I, I think mm. it would be a shame if we don't at least cover well what was another sensational performance from a sensational player at the absolute top of the game. And I think the fact, you know, the manager said he was feeling something, the fact that he faded in the second half, that he couldn't influence the game, that he had to be taken off. I don't think it's a coincidence that Martin Odegaard comes off and we're 2 nil down five minutes later. Like, he was brilliant in the first half, Clive. And I'd, I'd love for you to spare, a, you know, a, a couple of words about his performance. Yeah, there were two the two major players in 2024 have been Ben White and Martin Odegaard and see them both mm-hmm. not on the pitch. It was no surprise. Well, I shouldn't say that because it was a surprise when they scored. When, but they've, they've, they've both been fantastic. And, and again, Elliot, on the rewatch, Odegaard was even better on the rewatch than I watched in the stadium. I mean, he's mm-hmm. literally doing everything. He's doing too much. He's literally emptying himself with the desire to to take us over the line, and it's just he's doing two men's jobs, you know. And um, absolutely fantastic off the ball, winning tackles, passes through the lines, the ability to take the ball in, two three people around him, just get out of dodge, no problem at all, and then switch the play to the other point of the other part point of the attack, just just tremendous and. He can do no more. And there was a moment when Diego Carlos did an overhead kick in the box and it kicked him in his chest. Turning point. Because he slowed after that. You know, again, that should have been a booking for me. But let's not go there. Um, it was reckless play and, he, and, he, and it hurt him and he was down. And he, the manager said he couldn't continue. I don't know what it was, what injury it was or why he couldn't continue, but I'm making that assumption. And we missed a lot of go forward and replacements didn't really didn't really change that situation they didn't really add anything in fact we got weaker in my opinion as the game went on with our players and whereas against Bayern we got stronger you know and again mm. it's back to why well, I don't so I, I said I don't worry about starting 11s but you've got to make sure that you have you can power up in the last 25 minutes of a game particularly a tight game against some teams and it, I'm Villa in the top six, so you need that ability. And I, I think once we didn't score it, the plan was in danger, in danger. And then you start to then you start to see fatigue and some key key people. It's even more in danger. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. I think people are annoyed at the fatigue excuse because Villa played more recently than we had. But you know, whatever you want to say about it. Villa, having played more recently, doesn't change how tired our players are, right? So, you know, you can, like, I can't control how, we we can't control how tired the Villa players are. We can only talk about how tired or fatigued our players are. And the problem is, which players? That we had to end the game without White, that we had to end the game without Odegaard, that Bukayo Saka, who was brilliant in the first half as well, both recovering defensively and attacking, uh, I think, faded badly, um... You know, that's not picking on him. I just just think he's carrying something and he only has so much in the tank, right? Um, Declan Rice, who is our protect everything player, faded. I think this was one of the first times I've seen Declan Rice look off it, Um, not just on the ball, but in particular in recovery. And their first goal, he's caught flat-footed. I mean, Martinelli is caught really flat-footed and we can talk about why that's the case when he's only just come on recently. But, you know, Rice was also caught flat-footed. So... I I just don't think you can look past fatigue, the knowledge that the Bayern second leg is on the horizon. Um, we we come off a, a pretty grueling run, and you know Villa did basically throw the city game with the players they rested. Um, you know they they played in a lesser competition in midweek. I, I'm not I don't I don't want to stray into excuse territory. Maybe Villa are fatigued, maybe they're not, but I do think fatigue's a factor, Clive. And we looked at April. And we knew what would make April even harder is the fixture congestion. And here we are in the middle of it going, why do we look fatigued? Why is this so hard? Like we knew this was going to be hard. And sure enough, it's really hard. You know? Yeah, I think I think basically, um, I think basically we have a situation where we have a number of fit players. Everyone, so we get these bulletins coming out from training drills saying, everyone's training, even Timber's training. So we have a fit mm. squad. But we don't have a match fit squad. We right, don't yeah. have a number. We have a number of players that can't do nineties at the moment, effectively. You know, so so they're there training. They're there in all the pictures. But where are they? 
And I could name a load. You know, where is Tommy Yassi? Where is even Zinchenko at the moment? You know, you, let's just keep going, shall we? Party, mm. where is he? Vieira, where is he? Smith Rowe, where's his fitness levels? You know, um, it's it's just so many of them that are just not quite there when it comes to the full 90s. And so I said something earlier in, in, the, in the month around when the petrol tank goes dry, you're going to want some of these players that we're disrespecting right now. And it's like, we need these players to contribute to the last half hour or the first hour. And, we, and it has to be a job share. It has to be on some occasions. The job share, I think we got it wrong, the balance yesterday. But I can say that in hindsight, when the team was picked, yeah. I was absolutely fine. Honestly, I was fine with it. And and we, we just need to find out where these guys are because people are unsure and they're saying things like, He's not trusted. He's not trusted. Why isn't he playing? So now we have this fit squad, yet we're not seeing some of them. And if we do, they're not always producing. And we don't know how fit they are. Let's be honest, Martin Ellie, we don't know where he is. Because he's not playing like the player that got injured at Sheffield United. He was red hot. Elliot, I watched him yesterday. He was not engaged in the game. And you know we like this player. Yeah. He was not yep. engaged in the game. I agree. Smith Rowe, not engaged in the game, just not wanting to put his foot into tackles. He lost a key, lost two key duels that led to two goals. You know, so it doesn't matter. People got to put your hand up and say this. Uh, there were miscontrols. There were bad passes. Should have, you know, Jorginho, the man that never gives the ball away, gives the ball away, should have gone bigger, goes short. Mm. These are, these are well-intended issues we just got caught, you know? So I can't sit here and say, Georgina paid a bad pass. Oh, wow. He's paid a number of bad passes in his wonderfully successful career. But mm. it, it happens. Do you see what I mean? And it doesn't mean we have to um, dig these people out per se, but we should be able to talk about it without making excuses. And we did a num. Our decisions got worse throughout the game. Our execution yeah. quality got worse throughout the game. The first half of me, Elliot, was like Brighton at home this year. It was that good. You've listened to my inter instant reactions for many, many years now. Yeah. I'm pretty accurate how the game's going to go, but I've never got it more wrong from first half to second half. It's just a complete contrast. It looked like Brighton at home, the 2-0 game, it was that intense, that sharp, that quality. We didn't score the goals. And the second half had a big reminder of West Ham at home to me, which I was sitting there watching. And I had that same feeling, the same walk to Tube Station with their fans. Very, very similar. And yeah, we recovered then, didn't we? So why can't we recover yeah. now? I think we need to deal with the Zinchenko issue. It's, it's important. We're 37 minutes in. We need to deal with it. I also think Mikel who I will not criticize for a starting lineup that led to a great first half performance can come in for some criticism for the subs. And I think there's one or two other bits and pieces in the forward line that we have to think about really carefully um, and where this leaves us. So why don't we do this? Why don't I uh, do a, an, an ad read? And what you really want to do is stay for the disclaimer because I, I do a great disclaimer and I think it'd be a shame if you missed that. But of course, if you're a patron, you're not going to hear it. And then um, I can tell you one more time, look, it's last week. You want to go to the Bournemouth game in a VIP box, give anything you can. If you can't give anything, I totally understand. But if you give, you're helping kids in a refugee camp who need this program, a program that I've seen up close and personal. I know what it means to them. I know what Arsenal means to them. Every pound you give right now is three pounds. Every 10 is 30. Every 100 is 300. Um, let's get to that goal together. You know, maybe it's a little bit of good karma for us too with everything we have ahead. So, uh, justgiving.com forward slash page forward slash AVP. Okay. Now, uh, whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, which of course is also a world-class athlete, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Arsenal Vision Podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by the Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, you want to listen up. The technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, rejuvenation. You can all use all of that, I believe. Whether you're here in the United States or hundreds of other locations around the globe, access to a center is easy and it's affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash arsenalvision to learn more and find a center near you. Now listen up for the spelling. It's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash arsenalvision. 
No material testimonials in the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking new healthcare regimen, including EA System Clive. Is that enough of that? Indeed. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Um, okay. Let, let's just do a Zinchenko section. I mean, we, we can talk about how the game turned and why the game turned and all that, but people want to hear what we have to say about Zinchenko. And I think given the the heat around the player, we should talk about it. Look, some players have goodwill in the bank. Some players do not. And you can get into whatever the reasons are, but this player does not. And it is clear whether you're in the ground or whether you're on social media that the frustration with this player is evident. What I would say is it is a tricky conversation because Zinchenko is not playing the way we need a left back in our team to play. I think he brings things that are very good that people undervalue, but there is simply no denying that his lack of commitment to defending, that his lack of commitment to positional discipline, that his willingness to take risks that do not just where the reward does not justify the risk create a sense of instability that shakes the bedrock of the winning run we've been on. No matter how progressive he is with the ball, this, this team and the status we have achieved is built on a solidity that he undermines. And yet, the guy that is probably most likely to be the alternative to him, Kivior, was a halftime sub in his last two starts because the manager did not feel he could play one more minute with him on the pitch. Um, and, and that's not to kill the guy. He's a center back. Primarily, he's playing left back. I think he's had good performances for us. The other guy is Tomiyasu, and he's just not fit enough to be relied upon. And the other guy is Timber, who's not ready to play. And so we are in this tough situation where we don't have a guy at that position where you would say, yep, just put his name on the team sheet. He's going to give you what you need. So this guy is one of the options. And for a half against Byron and for a game against Brighton, it worked out. In this game, it absolutely did not. And the rage with him, the disappointment with him certainly spilled out, I think, at the ground, online. And and I sometimes wonder, I mean, Ben White had to go at him a bit. I wonder if the team feels the same way about him. He feels like the kind of player to me that should be on this United team, on Manchester United. He's talented, but he plays for himself in a certain way. He doesn't really seem to fit the ethos of what we're doing. And Clive, he made some mistakes in this game that even, ironically, though they didn't lead to us conceding, ultimately, I don't think the goals we conceded are due to him. The feeling is that he unsettles the the security, the stability of the team. So I, I don't I don't know how you parse this, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on Oh, that. mate, I've been thinking about it for, for weeks. And um, mm. so this is not difficult. Hey, look, I have a bias for stability in our fullback areas. I believe that there are poles that stop this team from tilting and rocking from side to side. So when I see our, our fullbacks not offering that stability, that's a concern for me. I've also got to hold my hand up and say, I didn't even know about inverted fullbacks till I met Zinchenko. So, and that gave mm. us a level of control last year, which I never knew. However... It also led to instability late in the season. And that's the bit that stayed with me. That's the bit that I worried about. And so I am more pleased to see a a bigger fullback there, shall we say, or somebody that, that can hold his side defensively, physically, but also progress. And we have, we have various levels. So the key of your one, we had a discussion about it. It's on my podcast, but I would disagree with me a lot on this. But my view on that was, he got he got run around a little bit against uh, against um, Bayern. Quite rightly, came off at half time. Why? Because we're two one down. We needed something else. We needed somebody on the ball. We didn't have the threats down down that side in particular. In the second half, the Bayern had what they wanted, and they dropped away and were less aggressive. So we were able to get control of the game along with Trossard and and Jesus, and he did it brilliantly. Um. Kivior is, is is a solid defender. Tomiyasu is another solid defender. We don't know where he is fitness-wise. For me, he's better on the left than he's on the right. I think on the right, I think he gets too narrow, doesn't go and get the game enough. He's too narrow. Sometimes he goes too high and leaves us exposed. But for me, Elliot, we're a team that's built on defensive stability. Just look at Gabriel. Just look at him and look at where he's running and ask yourself, is this right? You know, is this right? He's had his best form in his entire Arsenal career this kind of year. And a lot of that's based on his partnerships that he has at the back there. 
And so you have to decide as a team, what do you want your identity to be? And for me, our identity is our solidity, stability, the fact we only conceded four goals in 2024 in the league until until the Villa game. We're by far the best defensive team in the league and we look unstable all of a sudden. And part of that is what teams are doing to us. So I'm, I'm not going to dig out individuals because the Zinchenko stuff is too easy. It's too easy to dig him out. If you are number 10 at the back of your team, then fine. But I don't. I want defenders at the back of my team. And it's simple as that. If that defender's not quite good enough, we have a debate and see if we can make him better. But I know where he's going to stand. I need to know where he's going to be. I can't keep adjusting. This isn't rush goalie running around defending where you like. If you could do that, you're starting to impact the numbers of other people. And that's the, that's the discussion. We can forget the player. That's the discussion. Do you want to be that team? Do we need to be that team? We need to be that team 2-1 down in the Champions League quarterfinal at home. Absolutely. Do we need to do this against Aston Villa, who've got a lightning player on right wing and, and to be brought on by somebody else, and who've got another channel runner in Ollie Watkins? I, I think it's difficult to talk about his Arsenal game without talking about Villa because they were excellent in certain places. They worked us out really, really well. They used Aniolo to, to pin Ben White back, go long into him. They kicked the ball long 54 times, right? Into that side, not all to him, but they wanted to make us run backwards to make the pitch bigger, to uh, stop us pressing. Uh, to, uh, something that I learned from John McKenzie, I've seen it three times now, split the centre-backs wide, so it makes it very difficult for us to go and press them, right? They did it yesterday with Pau Torres, and Diego Carlos, who were both excellent. Yeah, they were excellent on the day. They split wide, they distributed well. Um, Tielemans and McGinn came in the middle, they took the ball, and they got out. They got out better than Bayern did. And guess what we saw again? So last week I came to the conclusion we need to keep Declan Rice as six. Well, he was six, he was still running back. So what's mm. the conclusion now? <clears throat> to change our pressing structure, we need to go to a mid-block because we need to get our stability back because we've been rumbled on our pressing structure. They're, they're pinning us around and they're getting out. And we are running our players into the ground, getting out easier. Yeah. And uh, I think you know they use, they use power tires a lot to get out to their left-hand side. They're, they're, that's their better exit side. Into Zaniolo, into um, Luca Dina, who's quite sharp on the ball. And and they did well. They they worked us out. And it's, it's something that I've seen in the last two games, mate, with my own eyes, is that something that we had over almost every team we play, which is like a physical aura, it's gone. It's gone. Because we've added a different fullback, right? And it me- it makes a difference. Honestly, it does. If you look at Villa, Zaniola, six foot two, they had a guy called um, in centre mid. Well, I also had Diego Carlos, who is like a man mounting, an absolute man mounting. And what a player he is. He was really good. Yeah. He was really, really really quick. They had a guy, I just don't get his name. Sorry, I just lost his name. Morgan Rogers, young Mm. English player, played in the 10. So classic Unai, pressing 10. And he was excellent in the duels as well. Really good, really strong. And they used their physicality. They used it well. And they coped with us on the regains. We normally manage that situation very well. Now you're in a transition game. So suddenly, you're exposing Zinchenko. Why? He's not a transition player. He's a player that's really good against deep blocks. Once we've got control, he is the man that wants to slice you open. When it's a two and throw game against really good, strong, physical, quick teams, that's not him. You have to decide if that's what you want. And me personally, I want defenders in my back line. But you've known that for years. This is nothing new to yeah. you. You know, I was I was one saying when Callum Chambers coming into our team, I wanted him to play right back ahead of Bellerin. I want mm. my guys locked. You know, I want them locked because that's, it's about stability for me. So I've been consistent on this, and it's not, it's not personal. I'm I'm fine with Zinchenko. You can play in midfield if he wants. Do you know, he can. Mm. In our back line, we need to know where people are going to run, where they're going to stand. We don't want to be hiding people on set pieces. We want them. We want them to do their job. You know, and um, and so yeah, it has definitely affected our stability. However, there is the other side of it. Second half against Bayern. 
his courage to get on the ball and get us playing again was exactly what was needed. Think back to one of his last games for Pep. I think it was the last game to win the league. They were losing the league. At halftime, they brought on Zinchenko. He can completely change the game. And they won the league off back of his MOM performance in the second half. He has a role to play, but I am not sure this was the right day for him in this day. It's tough because he has the personality to play a certain way that sometimes you need to play. But that personality never seems like there just doesn't seem to be any sensibility about it. Like trying to nutmeg Tielemans, for example, the edge of his box, he's going to play the way he plays. And there doesn't seem to be a good balance between risk and reward. And that drives people nuts, right? Because they just see the risk that he creates and he's not in, I think instinctively not a great defender in terms of his positioning and what he doesn't. And, and look, when you put Musa Diaby on his side and then Leon Bailey in his, on his side and he knows he, he's going to get run and then he drops and he drops way too far. So now it's easy for Villa to progress it beyond our back line because he's broken our line. It, it doesn't work. And yet, if you're going to play Kai Havertz in midfield and he plays 18 passes in the whole game, you you can't have Kivior at left back playing 14 passes at 70%, which is what he does. I mean, Zinchenko played the second to most passes in the game for Arsenal behind only Declan Rice. And like, yeah, but we would, but we have to, we have to stop this, mate. We have to stop this. He's a number you have to ten. Progress the ball from somewhere. He he's a number ten by design. He's yeah. a number ten by design. And so we have to decide what we're doing. This is not about him. This is about <laughs> our balance and what we I want totally to be. I totally agree. Yeah. And what we want to be. He played three excellent passes to Havertz over the top, right? And that's why he, that's probably why he was picked. If we score, so can those I ask chances, you a question then? We're, we're, we're having a different discussion today and maybe he's off after 65 minutes and we end the game with a 2-0 win. Everyone's everyone's off to the pump. But that wasn't what happened. And what happened no, was he stayed no. on for 87 minutes and he became progressively and progressively, progressively worse. And this is not new. He is excellent when he's fresh. He's excellent when he's sharp, defensively and attacking-wise. But as the game gets late things start to change concentration and energy wise and risks start to be taken and we become unstable. And this is not new for people listening to his podcast who are Arsenal watchers. This is not new information. We have, we decided to lean into this for this game. And that maybe yeah. that's the question. It, and, and it, so it's interesting, right? Like, do you think we could have started, for example, with Kivior at left back and Kai at eight? Cause then I think, you have a, a a lack of ability to progress the ball and and control the ball and it, it let, let's go to Mikel's comments about the second half by the way um we were struggling to bring the ball and do what we did in the first half we lacked this on the second half we lacked a lot of composure we rushed things with the ball we never had enough sequences in areas that we wanted, like we did in the first half. Credit to them as well. We lacked a lot in the second half. The game became more stretched, agreed, and more even without a lot of things happening, really. Obviously, when we conceded that goal, that was big blow, and the second one even bigger, bigger in the man manner it happened. I think one thing that Villa did really well in the second half is they just really recommitted to putting more bodies back to play out. They committed to playing out, and eventually... They were able to pull us out of our structure and find a pass behind our press and stretch us out a little bit. And not a lot of teams have done that. And you said it, Clive. And then all of a sudden you got Declan Rice turned around and running back towards his goal. And, yeah. and those are the things we don't want to see. And when you do get into that position, that's when Zinchenko is a massive liability. And so we agree Zinchenko became a huge liability in this game. Let's get to the manager's reaction to what was starting to happen in the second half. Because for me, and I look, Mikel forgot more since we started recording about football than I have ever known and will ever know, right? But for me, watching the way that game was developing, I felt, okay, get another midfielder on, get Zinchenko off, right? Tight, tighten up the defensive line, get more control in midfield. If you want to leave Jesus on, be my guest, but why not move Kai back up to nine and you know get Jorginho on? And we just waited and we waited and we waited and the game drifted away from us during that period. So what are your thoughts on the the what the changes that were potentially needed and the delay in actually making them happen? It's, it's difficult to talk about changes without recognizing the competing plans that are in place. 
you're dead right to talk about the build-up play. So they committed to almost like a six at the back, four up, right? So what they did in the second half is they dropped their mid-block back a little bit to take the ball over the top out of us and were much more competitive in the duels. So that's one thing they did. So their build-up play was good on occasions and they went long on occasions. I'm telling I'm telling you now, mate, it's, there's one common denominator in the last two games that I've seen. The goalkeepers were excellent in possession, dominant, cool, cool, calm and collected. And having that extra player caused us our problems. Split centre-backs caused us our problems. And so we weren't able to fully dominate, but we still dominated earlier, but our confidence faded slightly. And as they were getting out more and more and more, and I felt, again, if you watch it, you you can see football players who know they're in charge and they know that the opposition is fading. They started to do little flicks around the corners, little croys, slow down, knock it off, run after their passes, hold on a minute. And we just dropped. You know why? Because we were tired. We were tired and we couldn't get into, we couldn't engage with them. So we go to the substitutes bench now. So, hey, look, the substitutes bench is dictated by our starting 11. So three of our key substitutes are already starting. Now we've got, now what we've got, we've got Martinelli. What is he at the moment? Right? Smith Rowe, what is he at the moment? Right? Jorginho in that role, he just come on to try to maybe get us over the line. We know he's fine. He, he, it is not a problem there. It's he, just mistake, bad moment. That's, that's it. You know, so, um, and so we're in a situation where people are questioning why didn't he come on? Why didn't Vieira come on? Why didn't Party come on? You know, Tom Yasu came on for Ben White. Was Ben White on the booking? Was that the reason? Some people, you know, for me, I would have gone Tom Yasu to left back just to solidify things. But we don't know the whole story. You know, was it a booking situation? Was it an injury situation? Was it a buying situation? We don't know. Right? So I can only say that there were two competing plans. And the longer the game went on, our plan was never going to win. Right? So, and their plan was set up to contain, control, contest, make changes. They knew we were going to be aggressive, make the pitch big, make us run backwards, and then see what happens in the last phase of the game with our superstar, Leon Bailey, coming on to keep them running backwards. And they even did when they brought on Moreno for Zaniolo. It was another energetic player who had an impact in the first goal. A left back in front of a left back, very sharp players, creating energy, creating pressing, creating movement, making sure no duel was easy for us. And we were slow getting off the floor, which tells you we're in a bit of problems physically. You know, it's okay. You can get beat. You can get beat by a team's plan that worked really well on the day. They had a few outstanding players. And I've got to mention the keeper. You've got to mention the centre-back, Diego Carlos and Paolo Torres, Zaniolo. You've got to mention Rogers. These are excellent players. You know, Bailey, Diaby was okay. Bailey was a strong substitute, as good. This is this is this was nothing to be ashamed of. What if we're towing away open goals and heading it past the near post? You get what you deserve, right? You don't control the story, you don't control the afternoon. And anything that happens thereafter, you're not in control of. And that's the game. We have not got to throw the baby out of the bathwater with it, though. Yeah, it, it's so weird how the narrative around games develops, though, Clyde, because, like, the story of this game seems to be our defensive frailty and Zinchenko's bozo moments and the vulnerability we had, like, fair play. Like, Zinchenko had bozo moments. He was not good. He became a liability increasingly as the game wore on. But, like, at, you know, at 80 minutes, as I referenced, it's nil-nil, We've had all the good chances, really. I mean, they've had some near misses, but from speculative shots well taken. Um, you know, and and if we can find a winner late, we win. Um, the, the thing that frustrates me about the second half is we went from a first half where we put them under a lot of pressure to a second half where we had four shots in the whole half, and two of them were wildly speculative deck and rice shots that wound up in Rosette. So, like, we, we created nothing. So while I do understand why people have turned their attention to the defense, until the 84th minute, this was a pretty standard Arsenal defensive performance, at least statistically. We were suppressing shots. We were suppressing their ability to get into dangerous territory. 
but we couldn't control the territory in the second half. We were not able to push them back in the way we had been, and we couldn't sustain pressure. So it was a more comfortable game for them, and I just felt we were so slow to react. I do wonder what you think about the Havertz and, and Jesus thing. People are very frustrated. I think that we took Kai out of number nine, where he's been our best nine this season, and, and went with Jesus. So much of this feels post hoc because, again, Jesus literally dragged us back into the Champions League tie in midweek. Um, and Havertz playing eight worked in the first half. His late runs were how we unlocked them quite a few times. So the, the plan worked. We just didn't execute in front of goal, but not executing in front of goal, by the way, is sort of a, <laughs> becoming a hallmark of Jesus's time at Arsenal and his, his time as a player, period. So thoughts on, on Jesus? I mean, I thought he faded. I don't think he was... I, I think maybe it was Tim who said this. Someone said this, and I, I tend to agree with it. Um, I think actually it was Phil. Phil cost on the instant reaction. He's become more of a moments player, and he had moments in this game, but he's less consistently influential, dropping too deep, not o- occupying you know, the attacking areas as much. So I, I'm torn on this one because in a way, I think Havertz at eight worked in the first half in the way Mikel would have wanted it to, a way to break their high line with late runs. But as the game wore on, it it didn't work, and Jesus in particular looked like he wasn't working at center forward. Yeah, so we need a adult conversation here. Um, Jesus is not. I'll, a, I'll find someone to have that with you. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus does not provide the structure that we have grown used to in 2024. It's as simple as that. You you don't know where you can find him when you can find him. He's quite similar to Inchenko, actually. Mm. They're hard to build around. However, when they came. They were people we built around. Our, we built our belief around. You know, those two players gave us. I thought, my God, they came from City. We must be good, and then we were good. But they they both lack structure. You know, so and the reason why I want to mention the West Ham game. There was a moment in the West Ham game we were dominating them, and Jesus disappeared from centre forward. Disappeared. We brought on Eddie, and Jesus had two chances immediately from the left. And that's where my interest in him from the left really started to peak. Because, Elliot, I don't think he's an alpha, mate. I don't think he's an alpha that we need to lead our line. You put him next to somebody who's an alpha, he becomes much, much better. You know, he becomes the moments player Phil's talking about. He can do what he like off the sides. His work rate's outstanding. He can go in, he can sniff things out. He can twist your blood. He can do whatever he likes. But we need to find somebody, you know, and we need to know when to find somebody. And we need to know, we need to have diversity around finding that player, whether it be in the air, down the channels. If he doesn't run down the channels anymore, he wants everything to feet, which means people can squeeze us, you know. And this is what Kai's given us. He's given us, the, he's given us the channel runs. He's given us the aerial play. He's given us the feet. He's given us the link up. That's why he's a better centre forward. Those are the words I uttered two weeks ago, didn't I? He's a better centre forward than Gabriel Jesus. Those words coming out of my mouth. Do you think I, Gabriel Jesus, when we when we signed him, he was the most purchased player in fantasy football league, you know, as a centre forward, because they knew he was going to play there. Mate, there's some messages coming out today about his conversion rate, etc., which are not pleasant. You know, and um and that is not someone you can have leading your attack, I'm afraid. He needs to be in your forward space. And, but not leading your forward space. And then we have a decision mm. to make because he's 27 years of age. And do I need to continue? We have mm. a decision to make in, based on his contractual length and where his future position is going to be in this group. We potentially have a discussion to have. We don't have to have it now because we've got time. But in a year's to maybe this summer or the summer after, we're going to have a discussion about this player and where he is. You know, and it's not one to have after this game. So this is her list of discussion. This is one I wanted to have for ages. He is a player right now in our first. If he's in our first eleven, and he's off the he's off the left, isn't he? Let's be honest, mm-hmm. he's off the left. And we weren't saying that six months ago, mate. We couldn't wait for him to come back as a centre forward. Yeah, I just I think he's an excellent player. I really do. I just don't think he's the starting centre forward for a team that wants to win the title. It, at least not at the level that you have to be to win the title in the Manchester City 115 charges era. Um, he starts off the left in the game. We win at Brighton 3-0. He comes off the bench 
to rescue our tie against Bayern. Like we've seen him even recently. You know, there's this, there's, there's this feeling that the last time we saw him be really brilliant was almost sepia toned at this point. But like just in the last week, we've seen him be good twice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, not not as a center forward for us really though, and not starting at center forward. It, I think if you say that Gabriel Jesus is the 13th or 14th or 12th player in your squad, that's a really good place to be. Yeah. A guy that can play all three positions across the front line at that level. Same with Troussard. No one's saying that we can win the title with Troussard playing 38 games at center forward, but we love what Troussard has given us. He's yeah. He has given us some huge moments this season. Um, both of those players are at a level I am happy to have in the squad. And by the way, happy to have in the squad for the next two or three years into their 30-year-old season as the 12th or 13th player. But they are not. And Jesus in particular has proven me wrong in particular that he's, he's probably just not the center forward we need to be at the level that we need to be to win the things we're trying to win. Clep? Okay, and just I got, I got to caveat a little bit because, again, it's down to down to health. Where is his health? Mm. Right? Potential rumors of a summer operation. He's already had one this year. He's already had two while he's been at Arsenal. Where is he? You know, we, we don't know. And we're judging people based on things that we're not aware of. You know, and it's yep. difficult. But I have to say that because it wasn't so long ago we could not wait to see him on the pitch you know and so and things have changed and sometimes you find out things afterwards you know so um but right now in this group the way the group has evolved he's a he's a plus one off the sides mate we beat man city he played on the right you know um yeah and he's really good at doing it particularly when we've got people pinned back in deep blocks for a good side like arsenal are where we're going to have the territory He's a really effective player. When teams see him there, though, they can squeeze up and make the distance he's big in behind. And he's not winning those races, mate, in behind on, on 15, 20 meter runs. It's not happening. All right. So, um, and so we need to do something else a little bit there and just evolve him to a different role. Or we have to, we have to make a, a more harsh decision, which I'm not really qualified to do. <laughs> I'm not suggesting, <laughs> but it's like, okay, what do you want? What do you want to be in those areas? And that's the discussion we're going to have going forward. Yeah, and the problem is when you've just lost at home to Unai Emery's Aston Villa in as painful a way as we have, having you know seen Liverpool drop points just earlier that day, and you know feeling really good, and then hitting the wall in that way. I think there's just that little extra bit of steam behind any critical reaction, right? So, you know, Gabriel Jesus didn't have an off day. He's shit. You know, this player's shit, that player's shit. And like, it is tough because you're going to give yourself whiplash if you experience the season this way. We beat Brighton and, you know, I felt, and I think most of us felt, holy shit, we are the best team in the world. Look at us. We just dismantled Brighton 3-0 at their place in a stunningly professional, expertly crafted performance. And then Villa comes to the Emirates, and for one half, we look like the same team. And in the second half, we don't. And at full time, it's everybody's shit, and we're not good enough. And it's, you know, it's, it's some very pointed criticism that probably makes sense in terms of the emotion, but maybe doesn't make sense in terms of all the evidence. Clive? Yeah, I, and when I see these situations appearing, particularly in the two games I've seen this week, I think this year I've seen the I saw the West Ham defeat, saw the Porto defeat, saw the Bayern two two, and seen this um, defeat. And the Bayern and, and Villa won really. Although we didn't lose to Bayern, the the, the challenges were very similar. Strong centre backs, strong centre mids. You know, a strong centre forward for Bayern that want to fight you. You know, counter-attack, spinning behind, get you running backwards. What do Villa do? Bit more build-up from Villa. But again, Manuel Neuer, what is he? Look at his arrogance on the ball. Look at Martins, his arrogance on the ball. Suck you in, pop it round you. Long balls behind you. Keep your guessing. You can't get your aggression on. You can't keep your intensity going. Various lengths of, of exits. Really good. Strong, quick centre-backs in Diego Carlos. Strong players that want to fight you. Foul you. Take the booking. No messing. Take the fouls. Don't let you turn around. Our players getting off the floor in bits and pieces. You know, physically the same size as us, as big as us, which means we can't dominate them. This is how, This is it. Tactically, physically, we've had a couple of match-ups this week. 
You know, we're going to the NBA playoffs soon. It's all about matchups, isn't it? The matchups mm. that suit you. We've had a couple of teams that match up Newcastle Spurs. My goodness, Newcastle's front line is not the matchup that Spurs want, given their back two system they have. And it was obvious. Could they change? So we have a decision to make. Because we've been stretched out the last couple of games. And that's why I started to worry about this team. We're better off the ball than we were last year. So do we need to calm down? Do we need to go to a mid-block and let people come on to us? Do we need to stop being aggressive to be more energy efficient? You know, if you were here last week, this is a conversation I was going to have with you. I think we need to calm down a little bit. We're trying too hard to win in 10 minutes. We need to calm down because while we're trying so hard, we're leaving ourselves open. And we haven't been open. We've been controlled. We've executed. We've been consistent. Stop trying to desperately, desperately, desperately to win with the risk being too great where we're leaving ourselves vulnerable to people who are as big and fast as us. Yeah, uh, it's tough because while I, I agree with a lot of that, I think this is the danger. This is what's really hard for a manager. Sometimes you have to react to a loss with big changes, with adjustments, because things aren't working. And sometimes you have to do the opposite. You have to zoom out and look at what's real and what had worked and kind of make a decision about whether any change is actually needed or if the best thing you can do is make no change at all. And, and I confess that I don't know what the right answer is, but that's a really hard thing to do because just to put it in perspective again, in 2024, the second fewest big chances conceded by one of the big six sides, right? The second fewest is 22 by Chelsea. Before yesterday, we had conceded five. Five. Mm. Second fewest was 22. We conceded two yesterday. Not good, obviously, but before, before those last two, none. I, I think we have been very clearly, for even if you don't like data and just the eye test, easily the best defensive team in the league in 2024. And one of the best defensive teams in the world. Um, and you could make an argument, and I would be very, very inclined to believe this argument, that our problem against Villa wasn't our defense, it was our attack. Because 84 minutes into the game, yes, they'd hit the bar, yes, they'd hit the post, but really, they hadn't created much, and we just had failed to score. I mean, that's got to be a 1-0 game when Trissard gets that chance, and I really believe if it is, everything about this is different. I think Jesus has to do better with his header. I think Kai has to do better with the ball, uh, at least one of the op opportunities over the top. I think on another day, Saka brilliantly curls that one inside the post instead of past it, or his header, you know, that he, he kind of gets wrong and it pops over, goes in. Like, you get your lead in this game, and I think it probably winds up feeling and looking like a lot of the games we've seen in 2024. As it turns out, in the 84th minute, what happens? Something very uncharacteristic. Rice goes to sleep. Martinelli goes to sleep. Two of the players that I think are the most alive defensively in that. That does make me want to ask you about the Martinelli thing, Clive, because I, 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 this is a player I feel like we've lost. I, I don't mean like forever, but I mean through injury absences and now substitute appearances and his own form not being great this season, that verve and pop and sizzle about this player, that indefatigable spirit and and self-confidence and self-belief that oozes out of the way he plays, it, it it does not look like it's there at the moment. And no, it's not. It's it's a problem because that left-sided attacking role is unique and unique to his skill set. We ask that player to stretch. We ask that player to run the touchline, to run back to cover the left-back position, right? I think one of the things in the Martinelli change, by the way, was to, all right, I can't get Zinchenko off just yet, but Martinelli's going to recover. Martinelli's going to cover that space back. So I think it's that much more glaring that he's asleep for their opening goal. I, I think Martinelli is a player we don't have an analog for in the team. And so it is a big loss if we can't resuscitate his, you know, his season in the next few games. Yeah. So just to go back to where you started, I think the, the problem with this team was, yes, we didn't control the story by scoring, but the problem with this game was we didn't control the transitions. And in the second a, half in particular, yeah, we didn't control the transitions for long enough. And they, the transitions they had were scary and they scared us. And, we, and they, they affected our confidence. And we had a team set up for a team maybe that was going to sit in and we didn't have a transition team. And that's a worry for me. 
um, because I'm not sure how we're going to do it. Well, I'll I'll give you my thought process. We need to drop away a little bit and have a look at the game a little bit longer. But um, as for Martin Elliott, I saw it in my own eyes yesterday, and sometimes this is why I have an advantage. Um, And he was near me in the second half. He, He didn't quite look as engaged as he normally does look. You know, he wasn't getting back on side. Um, his, his dribbling was not with confidence and pizzazz. He's just 5% and everyone can see it. You know, <clears throat> he still can run, but he's not at his top speed. He's just not quite there. And and, and that, I've not seen him like this before. You know, just not seen him. So I think it is a worry. I, I don't know the story behind his injury. I don't know where he is, but he's not moving right. And he is no. the top athlete in our team. Repeat sprint abilities, un, unrivaled. And he's not moving right. So it's almost like, I don't want to talk about it because that's not right. You know, so mm. that means there's something, you know, something wrong with him, either, either physically or he's not mentally engaged. And so I'd, it's very difficult to speculate on that one because that is not the player that we know. Not even and, and we need him. We need, I, I think, you know, there are certain players I don't think we can replace, like Martin Odegaard, Saka, obviously, Saliba, Gabriel, all those things. But, you know, if you bring Jesus on for Saka, Jesus is not Saka, but he can play the way Saka plays, if you follow my meaning, mm-hmm. right? Like dribbly, try to beat a man, curl it with his left foot, whatever, you know, whatever the case is, you know, he, 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 he can try to do some of the stuff Saka does. Um if you bring Tomiyasu in, or, or if you bring Ben White in as center back, he can try to do some of the stuff that our other center backs do. Troussard can't do what Martinelli does. Jesus can't do what Martinelli does, right? Like, the players we have, I mean, Reese Nelson is probably the closest analog to Martinelli, just in terms of burst and ability to go stretch the pitch if you want him to do it. So I think we need him back. And I, I sort of wonder, you know, Mikel was asked after the match, why did you start Troussard over Martinelli? And he's like, because I'm the manager and I picked the team. I, I do wonder if he did it with an eye towards Bayern and wanting to have that that acceleration on the left and yeah. Martinelli might be carrying something and he he can't do it um, two, two games in a row. So we'll just have to see. Um, in terms of subs, by the way, we haven't touched on it really, but Emil Smith-Rowe, like, I love Emil Smith-Rowe and I want to see him succeed. But when Martin Odegaard comes off the pitch, we're just, we're just not the same team. And I think as much as I love Smith-Rowe, the fact that it was him and not Vieira, I think, is really interesting because I think Vieira is the better analog for the role, even if you like Smith Rowe better than Vieira. Really interesting scenario there. We don't know what's going on with Vieira, if, if he's fit at all, but that it's just a lost season for him. And Smith Rowe, I think, came on and just wasn't able to influence the game, especially because once we got behind, it kind of felt over. But any thoughts on on that swap and his limited time? I mean, he's being trusted now in a way he hadn't been previously. He's fit. But he, he couldn't influence this game. No, he couldn't influence the game. And I I would have brought Vieira on because having a lefty can bang shots is mm. what we needed. Right? So um so yeah, but again, we don't know where he is. We don't know where he is yeah. health wise. And and um and that's it. When was the last time I saw him? Really? Just a couple of minutes here and there. So the fact I'm saying I want Vieira on is based on memory. The fact that, you know, even Martinelli's a recent <laughs> his memories are about a month or so ago, you know, I mean, six weeks ago, things move very quickly, right? So, um, so yeah, we we got weaker as the game went on. I'm afraid, and and that's the truth of it. So, it's very difficult to go heavy on the substitutes and the lineup when we're playing every three days, and you know people are carrying things, you know yeah. they're not quite right, we know it. So what's the point of going two footed? It doesn't add anything to this to the discourse. We just need to maybe ask ourselves some questions around the, th- the theme I've seen the last week about how teams are playing against us. And the team that really woke, you know, made us run backwards first was Bayern, and we play them again on Wednesday. And interesting to see what we're going to do. Yeah, I, I, let's touch on that. But before we do, just last thing on this, any. Um... Any criticism? I don't like the word blame, so we'll go with criticism for uh, Raya on on either goal. Um, I have I did a little thing last week. Ella, you know, you posted for me on I did the player assessment thing. Mm-hmm. Um, when Raya is on form, 
He can jump to the top of the skyscrapers. He can bound, he can catch, he can carry. He exudes confidence. And the last couple of games, mate, since he appeared in my TV screen when he should have done against Bayern, he's not exuding the same confidence as he was. Mm. You know, as he was when he saved us against Porto, for example. Made a big save against Brian. The last couple of games, he's been shook. So we need to sit down and get him back to that confident level where he's talking, communicating, leading, and bounding around that that box. He was poor on the near post for that for that um for the first goal. Nobody was talking. So after you after you clawed straight through to the back post, right? And that's what caught us out. He shouldn't get he shouldn't get past the near post. We let it get through. That's where the mistake was. We should have won the duel on the on the second phase. We didn't. We allowed them to get a good cross in. It goes through our bodies, both our centre halves on the front post and our goalkeeper. And then we're what do we do as we look at the last event? So oh, Declan Rice was sleeping on the back post. Martin Lee was sleeping on the back post. Mate, stop the frigging cross from coming in. Make sure he doesn't get into those areas. That's what you should be looking at. And we didn't. And so it's a problem. He, I just want him to get his confidence back because when he's back, I'm not saying he's bereft, Elliot, but mm. he's took a knock in the last week, in my opinion, right? And but when he was really, really good, he was really, really good, and he he shut down the Ramsdale trending on my Twitter feed, right? So, but he's not making any saves at the moment, and that always yeah. worries me. That always worries me. All right. Um... Byron come comes quickly, which I think is a good thing, honestly, so we don't sit and just cogitate about this. But like uh in terms of the title, my instinct is that the title is gone. I mean, I'll just that I'm not saying it is gone. I'm saying that's my instinct, me personally. I think City will drop points. I don't see us navigating this run in winning all our remaining games. We certainly can win all our remaining games. But with a trip to Old Trafford and a trip to Tottenham trip to Wolves, by the way, which I don't regard as an easy fixture. Um, I think there's enough difficulty there, especially, you know, God forbid if we actually progress in the Champions League and still have midweek games. I think it's going to be tough. I Like, I don't think it's 100% gone, but I, I do I do feel now that City will go and, and do it again. Do you feel similarly? Well, we're taught we're told this every single day of our lives, aren't we? This team, mm. City, will get there. They'll get to where they need to get to, and it's also we we're psychologically beaten before we are beaten. It's only to if they draw one game and we win it, we're back top. Yeah, what, what, I don't understand it. You, this is what it's a, it's, a, it's a competition. It's not a possession unless you want to make it one. It's a competition. Mm. We need to fight. Villa's one of the probably the hardest game we've got left. Without a doubt, it's the hardest game. People are looking at Wolves. Wolves are not as good as Villa. We could lose to Wolves, obviously. They're not as good as Villa. Spurs are not as good as Villa. Man United, don't don't get me started. Now, in our minds, they're difficult games because we've got to go there. They're difficult journeys. They're not as good as Villa. Mm. No chance. You know, and so it's a, this was a difficult game. And they played very, very well. But we can't be handing out things. Look, in the back of my mind, and back of many of our minds, we know we're close. We're a little bit concerned if, we, if we're not quite ready yet. Are we going to score the goals when it really, really matters? And now we've added a bit of instability in our defence. It can be recovered with one tactical performance and our belief comes back immediately. If we do go to Bayern with the right system, with the right players and they perform well, we come back huge as a team and Wolves are going to get brushed aside. You know, so so it's mm. about the next thing we got to do. we got to go out buying with a proper plan, take away the running pace from them, mid-block them and let them have a the ball a little bit and see what they're going to do. And then we take them and we see, how, we see if they can defend. Can they defend against us consistently one-on-ones? Can they? Let's see. But let's not hand them the pitch that we did against in the first game. But I think we've seen enough now to recognize that we can get at them, but we have to bring everything we've got, you know, yeah. Brian have just yeah. lost the league. Who knows where they are emotionally. There's some injuries in their wide areas. They've got a different left back who cannot handle Bukayo Saka. No chance Guerrero can handle him. 
we've got a chance to to turn this around. But if we don't believe it, well, what are we all doing here? We just do we think sport is all about just winning? We just got to win. January comes along, let's just win twenty games straight out of our conceding barely a goal. And if we don't, we're just going to panic. Sack the manager. All the players are shit. <laughs> well, I sometimes I ask myself a question. Sometimes, if we as fans are ready to win, are we strong enough to win? You know, I ask myself that question. I ask myself that question all the time. We all look at the players, but are we ready to win? Unless it's perfect, it's not perfect. Football's not perfect. Sports not perfect. You have to fight through these things. This is where I think Arteta's comments were perfectly, perfectly said. Don't be, don't be walking around clapping the fans, all the rest of it. This is the moment now. What have you got? Mm. What have you got in your locker? What have we got as fans in our locker? It's nice when we win nicely and get fives and sixes and we're emptying stadiums. What have we got when the one time we trip up? Do we just chuck it? No, mate, this is the time to get big. This is the time to get loud. And I sent a message out. I, I, we had a chance to go to me, didn't we? We didn't take it. We couldn't quite do mm. it. You're just, you're just back from holiday. We couldn't quite do it. But I, I, it's a big part of me. Wish I was going out there because this is the moment you need to, to, to stand with the team. This is the moment. You know, this is yeah. the moment. And look, I mean, <laughs> Bayern just lost the Bundesliga to Leverkusen. You know, mm. it's like, and we're regarding them as some, you know, un- unbelievable behemoth. Like, it, it can be done. And they won't have Nabry, and they won't have Kingsley Komen. They will still have Kane and Sané. That's going to be difficult. Um, I just think maybe this is the day for the Eddie had performance everybody hated so much, uh, neutrals hated so much, right, because it's so boring. Except Bayern give you that little bit more when you counter than City give away. And we know we can low block it if we have to. You're not going to do that with Zinchenko. But we know we can low block it if you have to. And, you know, I read a lot of really interesting stuff after the first leg and, and before the first leg against Bayern saying, you know, Bayern, when they can go quick to those dynamic attacking players in space, they can really kill you. When they have to possess the ball and, you know, there's space to attack their back line, that's when they're weaker. And all you have to do is look at the names of their back line and it checks out. You know, how scared are you of Eric Dyer defending in space? You know? Like, I think, yeah. I think got, it's there for us, Clive. Us. If we, yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah. mate. We got sorry. we, yeah. I was just because I think I think it is there for us. So just let's not let's not do a whole Byron preview. We'll do one um, over on Patreon. But like, do you do you have a quick thought on lineup? I think the hardest thing for the manager is losing this game this way right before we go to Byron might create some question marks for him around selection that might not have otherwise been there. And again, with him saying. I mean, he said Odegaard felt something and could not continue. That's a worry. Ben White came off. We know he's carrying something. If Tomiyasu's fit, I think I'd like to see him start at left back, but he can't do that if he has to start at right back. So what, what's your what's your thought on lineup and how we might be, you know, who might even be available? I love that hospital pass question. You tell me all the doubts mm. and then say, well, what's your lineup then, Clive? Well, how the hell am I going to get a lineup? <laughs> <laughs> no I got no, no one's available. Who's your, yeah, who's no your one's lineup? available. So guys, what's your lineup? <laughs> no, I, you know, I don't give a monkeys, right? Um, but I do care about how we play. And I've seen two games now where we've been stretched a little bit. And only, only the second half, last half hour against Villa and maybe for half hour against Bayern. That's it. So I'm, apologies if I'm over-indexing it. But in those two games, I ask you, did you feel comfortable? You, you, uh, I didn't feel comfortable against those those two teams. And so we have to learn from it. So we've got to get ourselves back to being compact, first thing foremost, and don't show anyone your edges. That's the first thing we do. And then once we do that, we can play. We get our playing confidence back. Again, first hour of this game, we were excellent. Didn't score. There's not a lot wrong, but we just need to tighten up a little bit and get maybe get a bit more competitive in the jewels when we need to, and just calm the hell down. Just calm down. Slow down our build-up. Be more decisive. And I'll tell you what we could do if we'd, we'd lost a little bit earlier. That time we scored a set-piece goal. That'd be nice. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We were getting those three goals, and they've disappeared, right? And um, again, we've been pretty close on the cases. hasn't fallen our way. 
But that's all it's that's all that's needed. Just one of those. And they've got a problem. Big problem with the home crowd, the pressure. You know, we just get back to basics. Back to basics and rebuild things from that there on in and for me, the team's identity is based on our defensive solidity and our and our ingenuity in attack. All right, so we've just lost that bit of stability, and we look a bit jaded in attack. That's it. It, it can come back. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm telling you, if if we're going to do anything in Munich, I just have a feeling that it's got to be a night where we rediscover Gabriel Martinelli, because I think if we are going to sit a little deeper. And if the spaces are going to get a little bigger, he is the player in the Champions League that can that can do things in those big spaces that few of our players can do. Um, and Martin so Elliot it would be, a Seville would be nice, him. wouldn't it, mate? That's the guy we yeah. need back, you know. And that's uh, what we need. That's what we do for one moment. That's it. So. Well, we'll see what we get. It's a big. It's a big week for the club, and I think. Look, you could argue that we dropped points against Villa because of the Bayern tie, but I think you can also argue having Champions League to refocus on as opposed to a week to just sit and stew about this is the best for everybody. We can turn a painful week into one of the most joyous weeks we've had in 14, 15 years. So let's go do that. Um, And certainly we all have to be united to do that. And I realize, you know, as someone who right now is experiencing my connection to Arsenal online predominantly, there is a, a fair amount of toxicity and anger out there. I totally get it. Look, that's the kind of loss emotionally where I feel like you'd get a 24-hour hall pass to just kind of rage and say stuff that's yeah. probably a little bigger than you mean. Yeah. But now it's time, I think, to row it in and get it back together. And, and look, I don't want to be the person telling people how to fan. If the way you like to fan is to complain and be miserable, like there's no wrong way to do it. I just think you have to do what what's most healthy for you, but hopefully we can – pull it back together, zoom out, look at the context of how good we've been for so long and not throw the baby out with the bathwater and forget how we got here by just being absolutely imperious for four months. And hopefully we can uh, get back to that. I think the way you measure greatness is not how you navigate the easy times, it's how you navigate the hard times. So one of the measures of greatness is we just took a, a body blow. Can we get right back off the mat and be back to great again? Can you do that? You know, can you be back to great quickly again. I mean, you look at what happened uh, West Ham and Fulham games. At that moment, no one was feeling like we were on the brink of being one of the best teams in the world, and then we became it. Granted, we had to go to Dubai, so maybe if they can get a quick uh, (laughs) overnight trip there (laughs) between now and Wednesday, that might help. But we'll see what happens. We'll leave it there. Look, we'll... um, Maybe we'll do a, a bit of a Bayern rewatch slash preview tomorrow over on Patreon to get us ready for that tie. And then we'll obviously have a live instant reaction at full time uh, of the Bayern tie. And then the next day we'll have the main pod and we're all here together. And I hope you will just spare a moment to maybe give to the fundraiser. It's it's a great thing to do. And it, it's a reminder that it doesn't always just have to be about the score at the end of the 90 minutes. It can be about community uh, and doing good works. So uh, Clive's on Twitter, Clive PFC. Clive PAFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Smith. You can block me on Twitter. I'm really, really happy to be back. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. Great to go on holiday. Great to be away with my wife and spend some time together, which, you know, we don't get to do enough. I would have given anything to not have been away uh, that the last week and to have done it maybe during the international break or timed it better. But I'm back now. I am raring to go. And much like Gabriel Martinelli, you will rediscover me uh, for the run in as we go on to win the double. Uh, we love you. Hang in there, everybody. And we will talk to you after Arsenal 10. Byron, no.